Tracking Monsters from Park Scientists by Mary Kay Carson Background Park Scientists, Gila Monsters, Geysers, and Grizzly Bears in America's Own Backyard is about opportunities for scientific study in America's national parks. In this excerpt, the author joins researchers and citizen scientists in southern Arizona's Sagara National Park to gather data about Gila Monsters, These large lizards are notoriously difficult to study. Tracking Monsters Researchers use radio telemetry to track Gila monsters in and around Sagara National Park. Sagara National Park in southern Arizona looks like a giant cactus garden. Acres of evenly spaced cacti in every imaginable spiny, prickly shape grow out of pastel-covered gravel. The park's Sonora Desert home is full of fierce plants adapted to living thirsty. Tough grasses, waxy-leafed bushes, and smooth-skinned trees fill the space between the cacti with smells of cooking herbs, tar, and soap. Sounds are part of the desert, too. The background buzz of insects is broken by the hawk's call. And there's also a beep, beep, beep noise. The beeping is coming from a small black box carried by a man wearing a wide-brimmed hat. Brian Park also holds up what looks like an old-fashioned TV antenna. The beeping box and antenna are radio telemetry instruments. Brian is using them to zero in on a critter with a radio transmitter inside of it. The beeps are getting louder. That means she's nearby, Brian tells the half-dozen people hiking up a hill with him. Being careful to avoid the prickly pear and fishhook cacti, he sets down his gear near a hump of granite. The sun-hatted hikers circle the big rock and begin inspecting its crevices and cracks. She's visible, everybody, Brian announces. He stooped over and is using a small mirror to bounce strong desert sunlight underneath the rock. Everyone moves in for a look. I can see her head in there, someone says. A crouching middle-aged woman puts her hand on the rock to steady herself. I wouldn't put your fingers there, warns Brian. Why not? The animal stuffed underneath the rock can deliver a painful, venomous bite. It's a Gila monster. Monstrous Lizards Gila monsters are big lizards with powerful, clamping, venomous jaws. They're the largest lizards in the United States, growing up to 2 feet, 61 centimeters long, and weighing up to 3 pounds, 1.4 kilograms. Gila monsters belong to a reptile group called Monstrosaura, says Kevin Bonine. He's a scientist at the University of Arizona and heads up a Gila monster study. Monstrosaurs roamed alongside T. rexes and other dinosaurs 100 million years ago. Today, the only other remaining monster lizard species is the bearded lizard, which is also big and venomous. Gila monsters make their homes in the deserts of the southwestern United States and northern Mexico. They're common in Arizona, and it's hard to mistake the large, slow-moving lizards. Gila monsters are chunky, low-to-the-ground lizards covered in pink, orange, and black skin, studded with tiny, pebbly bumps. Gila monsters are an iconic species of the Sonoran Desert, said Kevin. But being famous hasn't gotten Gila monsters much scientific attention over the years. Gila monsters aren't easy to study. They're nocturnal much of the year and spend a lot of their time in underground burrows. Gila monsters don't need to be out constantly searching for food like a bird or mouse does. A large adult lizard may eat only a few times a year. Their favorite food is a nest full of baby bunnies or quail eggs, said Kevin. Gila monsters are expert nest raiders. The Gila monster's name comes from the Gila River region of Arizona. Kevin Bonine is a herpetologist, a scientist who studies amphibians and reptiles. He's hoping his research will solve some Gila monster mysteries. We're not sure how many Gila monsters are out there or exactly what they do all year, says Kevin. Scientists don't even know the time of year the lizards are born. Gila monsters' moms lay eggs in an underground burrows in the late summer, and baby gila hatchlings leave burrows the following spring. When exactly they hatch during those 8 to 10 months is their well-kept secret. 
Perhaps they hatch in autumn and the hatchlings spend the winter underground. Or are they in the egg for a heck of a long time? asked Kevin. The list of needed answers about Gila monsters in and around Segura National Park is long, says Kevin. How far do they travel in a year? Do they leave the park? How many burrows do they use? Do roads and housing developments affect them? There's a whole lot of mystery, Kevin says. Warning! Armed and armored. Gila monsters look ready for a fight. Their skin is covered in round bumps filled with bone called osteoderms. This studded skin covers their head, tail, and body like armor. Long, powerful claws for digging and strong, powerful clamping jaws are their weapons, and so is their venom. They have venom glands in their lower jaw, explains Brian Park, a Gila monster researcher. Unlike a rattlesnake, a Gila monster can't inject venom. The venom simply mixes into its saliva or spit, and they feel threatened. When they bite you, they latch on, explains Brian, and all that venom trickles into you. Sharp, grooved teeth help deliver it, as does chewing on the victims for a good long time. A Gila monster bite is intensely painful, but not fatal to humans. There's no anti-venom treatment, and the bite can make a person sick for weeks. Medical scientists are interested in the venom that Gila monsters make. They've copied unique chemicals found in the lizard's saliva and are testing them as possible drugs for diabetes, attention deficit disorder, and memory loss. While Gila monsters look tough, they aren't aggressive and don't go after people. If you see one, it's likely to be shuffling away from you. If you don't ever stick a finger in front of one or pick it up, you should never have a problem, says Brian. Most bites happen when harassing a Gila monster. If pain and suffering aren't reason enough to steer clear of Gila monsters, how about the law? As a protected species, harassing, handling, collecting, or killing them is illegal. Gila monsters were the first protected reptile in Arizona and in 1952 became the first protected venomous animal in the United States. Female number 291. The Gila monster that Brian Park has tracked down is providing some clues. Gila monster number 291 has a radio inside her. Kevin's team has implanted tiny transmitters inside eight different Gila's. Now that Brian's telemetry receiver has found number 291 under the big granite rock, Brian and his helpers get to work. As she snoozes undisturbed in her burrow, they write down the lizard's GPS position, note the time of day, take air temperature and humidity measurements, and list the kinds of plants growing around her rock. All of this information will help scientists figure out how much Gila monsters travel about and why. The study is finding that how much a Gila gets around depends on its age, sex, habitat, and the season. During spring and early summer, for example, when males are out looking for mates, they will wander more than females generally. Female number 291 may be on the move too. She was down the hill in the picnic area near the road just two weeks ago, says Brian. Is number 291 looking for a place to spend the winter? The radio transmitters like this one that scientists surgically implant into Gila monsters are about the size of a AA battery. A radio collar wouldn't work because it would get in a Gila monster's way as it squeezed under rocks or into holes. Gila monsters don't have permanent homes. An abandoned pack rat burrow might be a good cool summer spot, while squeezing under a sunny rock can provide a cozy winter shelter. As with all reptiles, the body temperature of Gila monsters changes with their environment. The beeping radio inside the tracked Gila monster also estimates its body temperature. The warmer their body temperature, the faster the radio beeps. Researchers carefully record the body temperature of each lizard every time they track it. That way they know how much warmer or cooler the animal is in the various shelters it uses throughout the year. The rock that number 291 is currently under Gets a lot of sun on one side, says Brian. It might make a decent winter home. The herpetologist Kevin Bonine uses radio telemetry to track the wanderings of Gila monsters. Bioblitz and microchips. Filling out number 291's data sheet is taking a bit longer than usual. 
Everyone except Brian Park is new to Gila Monster Science. The hikers are volunteers taking part in BioBlitz, a 24-hour scientific inventory of every species in Sagora National Park. They are among the thousands of citizen scientists helping out during the event so that lots of people can join in the activities and learn about biodiversity. BioBlitzes often take place in national parks near urban areas like Sagora National Park. The city of Tucson, Arizona, fills the space between the park's two separate halves. Citizen science is important for involving the community, says Kevin. It's a big part of the study that researchers at the University of Arizona, including Kevin Bonine and Brian Park, are doing in Sagara. In fact, their Gila Monster project depends on it. We try to get the public to send us their sightings, explains Kevin. How? They've posted colorful signs at kiosks near trails and in visitor centers. The signs say, Have you seen me? Above a plump pink gila monster. Below the photos are instructions for documenting the sightings and sending in the information. Kevin says people out hiking and park staff can really help us out. The key is taking a photograph of the gila monster that clearly shows its markings. The pattern on each individual is like a fingerprint, says Kevin. Researchers use the color patterns to identify individual Gila monsters. Sometimes the researchers receive a photo from a citizen scientist that matches a Gila monster they've tagged, which is pretty exciting, says Kevin. The Gila monster project has been tagging the large lizards with microchips since 2009. Each tiny microchip tag looks like a metal grain of rice. It's the same kind of ID microchip tag that veterinarians use for dogs, cats, and other pets. Each tag has an identification number that a handheld scanner can read. We've tagged more than 150 Gila monsters, says Kevin. Every new Gila monster that the field biologists come across gets a tag. By implanting a radio transmitter inside a Gila monster, researchers can track the lizard's movements over time with radio telemetry. Above. The skin bumps of Gila monsters have tiny bones in them called osteoderms, close up top right. The patterns of color are unique to each animal. This Gila monster tag, bottom right, is a small metal pellet with an ID microchip in it. Catching Monsters The punishing desert sun is sinking towards the distant mountaintops, but it's still 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 29 degrees Celsius. The giant piled up pink and beige boulders soak up heat like pizza stones. Kevin doesn't seem to break a sweat, however, even though he's got one hand firmly gripping a gila monster. In his other hand is what looks like a small plastic toothbrush. Kevin puts the softer end of the plastic tool on the monster's closed mouth and gives it a nudge. How do you get a gila monster to open wide? You talk very nicely to him, jokes Kevin. Evidently it's true. The smoky pink lizard takes the bait, giving the plastic prod a few chomps. It will leave behind enough mouth cells for a DNA sample. Kevin estimates how much fat is stored in this Gila monster's tail by measuring the volume of water it displaces when pushing into the graduated cylinder, left. Well-fed, healthy Gila monsters have fat tails. The white plastic probe collects mouth cells full of DNA when chewed on, above. Gila Monster Project researchers such as Kevin and Brian hike and drive in Sagara National Park regularly, tracking and checking in on the Gila Monsters with radios and looking for new ones. When they come across a Gila Monster, they catch it, very carefully. Foot and a half long medical tongs can help hold a squirmy one still. Each animal is measured, weighed, photographed, and injected with the microchip tag under the skin. Researchers also measure the volume of its fat-filled tail to find out how well-fed it is. The plastic stick chewed on by the lizard is sent off to DNA for analysis. It gives us the ability to answer a whole range of questions, says Kevin. Big picture questions such as how similar Sagara's gila monsters are to those in California or Mexico, and how closely related the lizards in the park are to one another. Researchers measure each animal's head width using calipers left. Body length is measured as well as overall length from snout to tail tip, right. 
One of the goals of the Gila Monster Project is learning what these large venomous lizards need to thrive so they can be protected in the future. Are highways and fences separating Gila monsters and creating small, fragmented populations? DNA studies can tell if they are losing genetic diversity or inbreeding. Are new neighborhoods taking away needed habitat? Comparing the lives of Gila monsters not in the park with those inside it can help find out. We want to learn a lot more about them, both in the protected areas of the park as well as in the wildland urban interface, says Kevin. That's where they interact with roads and cars, people and dogs, and that sort of thing. The Sonora Desert is something special, fragile and harsh, dazzling and mysterious. My life has always been tied to the desert, says Kevin of the Sonora and its creatures. He hopes that the work of the Gila Monster Project will ensure that future generations have that connection too. We are hoping to get data that will be useful for decades to come, he says, so we can learn a lot more about these magnificent lizards and help to protect them as well. If you're lucky enough to see a Gila Monster in Cigar National Park, take its picture and write down where you saw it, but keep your fingers to yourself.